We've looked for a sustained time at Calvin's doctrine of the natural knowledge of God. And the thing that stands out when we consider what Calvin was teaching, as received by Old Princeton and B.B. Warfield, and then appropriated by Van Til at Old Westminster, was that the knowledge of God, along with righteousness and holiness, are concreated in Adam, given to him at the same time he is created, native to him, inherent in him constituent features of the image of God. Thomas Aquinas is a theologian in the Roman Catholic tradition who stands out in sharp distinction from Calvin's teaching on this particular matter. What I want us to consider is Thomas Aquinas, particularly from his uh, commentary on the Book of Romans and a brief section in the Summa Contra Gentiles, Thomas Aquinas on the natural knowledge of God and the way his theology of the natural light of reason bears on the acquisition of the natural knowledge of God. Thomas Aquinas taught and was emphatic that there is no concreated natural knowledge of God in Adam as the image of God. He taught that while Adam was like God in that he was given reason and freedom, uh, intellectual and volitional capacity, the knowledge of God was not gifted to him or created in him, and neither was original righteousness or holiness. But Thomas taught this emphatically, that there is a quote-unquote inner light an inner light of reason. I have natural light on the board. It is a light that is derived from nature, but it is an inner light of reason derived from nature that is intrinsic to Adam as the image of God. And through that inner light, through that inner light of reason, Adam could come to the natural knowledge of God. And so, while Thomas denied the concreated, gifted character of original knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, he did affirm a concreated and gifted inner light of reason that gave Adam the natural capacity to know God. And so, this inner light is an intrinsic, rational capacity to attain to the knowledge of God that is available through nature. And Thomas has a very specific, very well-conceived doctrine of the natural knowledge of God. In his commentary on Romans, uh, page 59, he says this, Man's knowledge, and we're going to go ahead and and think about this with reference to Adam as created in the image and likeness of God, isolating his status as image of God, and compare and contrast him to Calvin, who said we must always begin with Adam and understand the integrity with which we were first, with which Adam was created. Here's Thomas. Quote, man's knowledge begins with things connatural to him. That is, things in his created realm of existence, namely, sensible creatures, which are not proportioned to representing the divine essence. Now, in a way similar to the way uh, Calvin taught, Thomas believes that You must begin with knowledge of self and knowledge of sensible objects. But he denies that knowledge of God is coincident with the knowledge of sensible objects, sensible creatures. For him, human knowledge is restricted initially. Human knowledge in what we will call nature, unaided by grace, nature, unassisted by grace, nature not yet reproportioned by infused grace, begins with sensible creatures, sensible objects that are not proportioned to the essence of God. 
So there is a qualitative ontological difference between God and the sensible creature, the sensible objects, those objects in Adam's purview for him to examine and reason in terms of. Now, this creates something of a problem that needs a resolution. If sensible creatures are the starting point for this inner light of reason, and those sensible creatures are not proportioned to represent and reveal the essence of God, then how is natural knowledge of God possible? If you, in other words, if you're starting with this inner light of reason, and that inner light of reason is immediately connected to sensible objects, and these sensible objects are not proportioned to the essence of God, there is no direct revelation of God available in nature. Thomas does not affirm direct revelation of God in nature to Adam. He affirms instead this capacity of the inner light of reason that takes as its starting point sensible objects, sensible creatures. So how is it possible for this inner light of reason that begins with sensible objects to attain to the knowledge of God? Thomas says this, and these are all quotations from his commentary on the book of Romans, pages 59 through around 61. He says, man is capable of knowing God from such creatures in three ways. And so instantly he says, not only does man begin with sensible objects, but the knowledge of God is from sensible objects. You begin with sensible objects. And, you are, and reason, the inner light of reason with Adam, was capable of attaining knowledge of God from them. No direct revelation of God, but a mediated revelation of God, an indirect knowledge of God. And he says there are three ways that this happens. He says, first, you know God from causality. Causality. You know God as you begin with sensible objects and reason from them using causality. He says, quote, For since these sensible creatures are subject to change and decay, it is necessary to trace them back. There's the, the quotation I want. Trace them back back to some unchangeable and unfailing principle. In this way, it can be shown that God exists. What is the pattern of reasoning? Well, through an inferential process of reasoning, the inner light of reason begins from sensible objects, and how are those sensible objects construed? They are construed in Thomas's language by change and decay. And reason moves from these natural, sensible objects characterized by change and decay to a supernatural cause of those objects who, in contrast, is unchanging as the supernatural cause. To put it differently, reason traverses from natural causes, pardon me, from natural effects, natural effects, sensible objects, to a supernatural cause, from the changing and decaying objects of sensation to an unchanging supernatural cause. So notice this as you think about what Thomas is doing, and please remember the differences between Thomas and Calvin 
and Warfield and Van Til on this topic. Thomas begins with sensible creatures subject to change and decay and argues it is necessary to trace them back to an unchanging and unfailing first cause, which we call God. Now, this pattern of reasoning makes knowledge of God, if you can see it this way, it makes, it suspends knowledge of God upon an inferential process of reasoning that traces back from sensible objects to God. This connatural end, Thomas says, is the knowledge of God. By this inferential pattern of reasoning, by the inner light of reason working, beginning with and working from sensible objects, you can reason to the knowledge of God as a supernatural cause. So, Thomas affirms an indirect, inferential, natural knowledge of God rooted in the intrinsic capacity of reason to discover such truths. This is his way of causality. Secondly, he says there's a, there's a second way. The way of excellence or eminence. Way of excellence or eminence. Second, God can be known by way of excellence. For all things are not traced back to the first principle as to a proper and univocal cause, as when man produces man, but to a common and exceeding cause cause. From this, it is known that God is above all things. Now, note that this knowledge of God, by way of excellence, comes once again from tracing back from sensible objects to God as a supernatural cause. Notice further that the way Thomas reasons here is that the inner light comes to know that God is above all things by way of negating what is imperfect in sensible objects and ascribing to God a corresponding excellence or eminence or greatness. This is the way of excellence. It's reasoning in terms of causality but it is designed to show that there is no univocal relation, no one-to-one -one correlation between the natural effect of a sensible object and the supernatural cause. They belong to distinct orders of being. God is uncaused. The creature is caused. The creature is changing and decaying. God is unchanging. And therefore, there is a categorical fundamental difference between the two in terms of their being. This is the connatural end of natural knowledge. Third, and these really do, two and three really do qualify one another, the way of negation. This is a compressed summary of what Thomas Elsewhere calls the five proofs. This is his exegetical approach where he reduces it to three. He says, third, God can be known by way of negation. For if God is a cause exceeding his effects, nothing in creatures can belong to him. And in this way, we say that God is unchangeable and infinite, and we use other negative expressions to describe him. So, for instance, if the effect changes, you negate change and say God is unchanged. If the effect is finite, you negate finite and say God is infinite, has no limitations. If you say the creature, the sensible object, is composite, made of parts, you say that God transcends that and is non-composite, not made of parts, not made of additional properties. If God as a supernatural cause exceeds his mutable and composite effects, then he is immutable and simple. 
But here's what you have to appreciate. And this must come clear as you're watching. If you are, are, are taking notes here and thinking this through, stop and ponder this. Notice that in each proof, Thomas is saying from this pattern of reasoning, it is known that God exists and it is known that God is unchanging, simple, etc. The knowledge of God is a work attained by the proper use of the inner light of reason and not a gift given at the alpha point of creation. For Calvin, the natural knowledge of God is a gift given at the very inception of creaturely existence. For Thomas, it is a work attained as the inner light of reason works properly from sensible objects and traces them back to a supernatural cause. For Calvin, natural knowledge is given to all. For Thomas, it is attained by some. And two positive points need to be made here about Thomas. Um, first, Thomas admirably, admirably uh, and commendably avoids the front door mutualism that infects Schleiermacher, Bart, Dorner, Hartshorn, Pinnock, Frame, Ware, Oliphant, and others. He affirms that God is immutable and simple in his relation to creation. That we should commend as a conclusion. The method is distinct, but the conclusion should be encouraged and confirmed. Second, Thomas affirms that there is a connection between reason and the knowledge of God. Bart and the modernist tradition that follows Bart denies any such connection between the natural light of reason and the knowledge of God. As we'll see later, Bart denies natural knowledge of God as concreated. He also denies there's any capacity in Adam before he was uh, as created. He denies there was a natural capacity to know God at all. And so Thomas affirms both that God is immutable and simple. Methodology aside, that conclusion is commendable. Bart also affirms that natural reason can come to know God. And that, we have to say, is commendable. He affirms at least the capacity for knowledge. But to return now to, to Thomas and to move this forward just a little bit, he summarizes his view by saying, God manifests something to man in two ways. He's given us three patterns of reasoning. Now, two ways that God manifests. First, by endowing him with an inner light through which he knows sensible objects. So God manifests himself in the giving of an inner light that can access God through sensible objects. Second, by proposing external signs, namely sensible creatures. So let me summarize this and put it as tersely as possible. The inner light supplies the concreated capacity to know God. Thomas is a capacity innatist. Denies concreated knowledge, but he affirms concreated capacity. Second, the sensible creatures supply the natural effects through which the inner light of reason can trace back to a supernatural cause. God gives the inner light of reason that has the capacity to know God. He gives the sensible creatures from which you can trace back to God as a supernatural cause so that man's knowledge begins, A, with the capacity to come to know God intrinsic to the inner light of reason, and B, with sensible objects that reason traces back 
to a supernatural cause. Once that inferential process concludes, Thomas says we have come to know God. We know him by the process of reasoning through causality, excellence, and negation. That, be, that knowledge begins with sensible creatures and from it traces back to God. Thomas says, thus God manifested it to them, knowledge, by endowing them with a light from which, a light or from without by presenting visible creatures in which, as in a book, the knowledge of God may be read. Now, let me give you one other quote. It's a fairly lengthy quote. It's from the Summa Contra Gentiles, um, 133, where Thomas says this, For according to its manner of knowing in the present life, the intellect depends on the sense for the origin of knowledge. And so those things that, that do not fall under the senses cannot be grasped by the human intellect except insofar as the knowledge of them is gathered from sensible things. Now, sensible things cannot lead the human intellect to the point of seeing in them the nature of the divine substance. For sensible things are effects that fall short of the power of their cause. Yet, beginning with sensible things, our intellect is led to the point of knowing about God that he exists and other such characteristics that must be attributed to, to, to the first principle. There are consequently some intelligible truths about God that are open to human reason, but there are others that absolutely surpass its power. Note that language. The natural intellect, uh, when it's not been reproportioned by grace, just simpliciter, the natural, natural intellect simpliciter, can attain only indirect knowledge of God as it reasons from sensible objects and natural effects to the suprasensible and supernatural first cause, namely God. These truths that God exists as unchanging and as simple are open to human reason, but have not been implanted in human reason, have not been concreated in human reason, have not been revealed to human reason directly. Reason then before the fall has the capacity to discover truths about God if used properly. That he exists, that he is the first cause, that he is perfect, that he surpasses the effects. But these truths are just that. They are the discoveries of discursive reason. Natural knowledge comes as the fruit of reason's work. This is called capacity in atism. And a key point that distinguishes Thomas from Calvin and Van Til turns on the relation of reason to the natural knowledge of God. For Thomas, reason is an inner light that can attain the natural knowledge of God when it is properly applied to sensible objects. But for Thomas, reason does not begin with the concreated knowledge of God. I hope that's obvious now. Reason gains natural knowledge of God, but reason does not begin with natural knowledge of God. But for Calvin and Van Til, God gives a knowledge of himself along with the gift of reason. Reasoning, therefore, begins with concreated knowledge of God. Remember Warfield's summary of Calvin? Knowledge of self, knowledge of God. We could add to Thomas, knowledge of sensible objects. All involve one another. Of course, reason can gain additional knowledge of God. But for Calvin, Warfield, Van Til, reason 
begins with the knowledge of God, gifted by God, that coincides with the first operation of reason qua reason. Thomas said there's nothing in the intellect but the intellect itself. Calvin spoke of the intellect and man himself enveloped in this natural revelation of God, gifted with the natural knowledge of God. But the question that we need to examine next is how does Thomas speak of knowledge beyond this connatural end? Let me put it this way as we're beginning to transition to speak of something additional. For Thomas, all that reason can give you by virtue of nature is a connatural end of in direct, inferential, natural knowledge of God. But Thomas also believes that by grace, a different mode of knowledge, a different path of knowing God can be opened that takes the knower beyond the natural to the supernatural, above the natural to the supernatural. And that knowledge comes by way not of the natural or connatural end of reason, but to the supernatural end of reason, reproportioned to the essence of God, which we will consider as we continue Thomas's view of the natural knowledge of God in relation to what we can call supernatural knowledge of God.